doing this for a long time. You're currently listening to the Broken Instruments podcast. This is episode two, where I feature my older brother, Maikuya. He's one of the best storytellers I know, so I definitely took advantage of the time to ask him about the art of storytelling and his perspective on that. Further than that, we talked about leadership, controlling the narrative, and ultimately how we can have better empathy for people. All right, uh, I want to welcome my... My older brother, my Kuya El Cid. Welcome, Kuya. Thank you for having me. So, um, El Cid, the the conqueror. <laughs> yeah, I, I, like honestly, I was so interested in how mom and dad came up with your name, but um, it makes a lot of sense for me. Someone that I always looked up to growing up. Um, I, I just want to start with, I guess, what I'm feeling. So, in the last few months, I want to say, like we we kind of crossed paths more, which is awesome. And I, I mean, I. I look at our, our interactions the last few months and, and it kind of brings me back to when we were young and like growing up, you know, you were always the guy that, that I sized up to. <laughs> you're the Kuya. Like, honestly, the way I looked at it, I was thinking about it this morning. Like, uh, you were like my first workout partner. You were my first basketball teammate, <laughs> things like that. So um, you're definitely someone I look up to. And, you know, the, our paths that are crossing now, the projects that we're working on now, like it's, it's super exciting for me. Um, especially the like the the films that you're writing and stuff. So a little bit about yourself, dude. Like you're a writer, you're a director. Um, go ahead, man. Uh, yeah, I mean, wow, thank you. <laughs> that was a really great introduction, <laughs> dude. No, totally. I mean, I feel like growing up, I think us two specifically, yeah. we shared the same room. Um, yeah. We we had a very similar path, but what was great is that we had both very um, unique outlooks. You know. I think uh, that's why I liked about us. We were like a good partnership. Mm-hmm. You know, always like Rocky and Colt, right? <laughs> you know, and, and, then, and then Matthew was Tum Tum. Yeah. But um, no, yeah, I really liked. And coming in now, you know, seeing what we've been doing the past few months, there's always this kind of like Venn diagram of I feel like we overlap on a lot of things, but we also have this unique view of what we want to do and who we are and, you know, how we see life. And I think that's amazing. It's great to have a partner like that that we can talk like this and we can understand each other, but, you know, bring different experiences, bring different point of points of view. But at the same time, we have that trust of just like, I'm, you you can say anything you want to me and I'll know it comes from the place of, you know, truth and heart, you know, and, and it's always going to make me better. It's going to make you better. And that's it. You know, that, that trust is very important as well, you know? And well, I mean, (laughs) as for me, I, I, I'm trying to be a writer and director, mm-hmm. and that's that's something that I've always wanted to do deep down inside. Um, but I think if I had to boil myself down to a core, I think storytelling and sharing is something that mm. I really am just about. You know, that's something that I I crave all the time is to share and connect with someone. You know, yeah. then that's where movies kind of um, you know kind of affected me and kind of influenced me is that. I realized it was an art form that you can connect on a psychological level, on a spiritual level, on, you know, on a experience level. And yeah, connection was just a huge thing for me. That's, that's very important. And, um, yeah. Like, you mean like connecting between people, connecting, connecting yeah. people with other people? Yeah. Not, not networking, but like connecting <clears throat> spiritually, connecting on a, on your souls and connecting on a psychological level where you find a, uh, a similar plane where you guys all have the same understanding coming like to an through understanding. through story through story through story is is important was there um a movie like from when we were young that like really stuck out to you that made you think like oh this this brought people together i want to mm-hmm. do something like this you know like growing up you don't i don't notice that um but if i had to i think there was the i mean <laughs> it's funny it's it's probably random but um titanic was oh wow a very yeah it was a it was influential in a way that it was the first movie that i saw affect the world on on yeah. a crazy level because everyone was talking about titanic and um we had the soundtrack mom would listen to it she would she, sing to it yeah like as a karaoke as a, yes karaoke oh, wow. and like, my heart will go yeah. on was like everywhere 
right? And it was it was so interesting to see how we saw that movie five times in theaters. I remember, right? And I mean, that, and that's rare because mom and dad don't like to watch movies yeah, in the theater. They don't they or they don't. never? I mean, back then they never really liked to. No, no. And that's the thing. It's like growing up at mama's house too. Yeah, we bonded over movies. Movies was one yeah. of those things. It's almost communal, where you know, like we sit down at the table to eat together, and we sit and we sit down on the couch to watch a movie together. Like, that's it. Oh, wow. Yeah, I didn't think about that. You know, and that was always really cool to me that we could sit down, watch a movie, laugh at the same time, you know, cry at the same time. And at the end, we're all in in a different place, right? But in the same place. And it was, yeah, that's always been something, you know, I've never actually said that out loud, (laughs) but I knew that that was always something that I loved about movies. It's, It's communal. And yeah, nowadays, you know, everyone watches on their phone, so people don't see that. True, true. So, yeah, it, and that's why cinema is really important to me. It, like having that experience of laughing all together in the theater. Yeah, it's. I didn't unreal. even. I didn't even think about that to be honest with you. That it is like it's one of those moments where people sit down together and, and experience like emotions together. Yeah, it's almost like a like a talk over dinner. Yeah, that our family always u- used to do. And in, in a way, movies can have that power to bring in a conversation that that family normally would never have right yeah it kind of sneaks its way in like a trojan horse where um like you guys are gonna watch a movie together and it brings up a topic and it's just like uncomfortable and we never yeah, yeah. we would never talk about it if no. it didn't instigate like that movie didn't show us something yeah exactly so, and and we see yeah. that movie all together but we all see different angles of it or we we yeah. perceive it differently because of whatever we're going through mm-hmm. yeah interesting man. different in your life right and yeah with titanic it was just like wow like i yeah universally people love that movie but you know it wasn't just that movie alone it was just a bunch of movies that we used to watch like there's something about mary you know that's yeah that's huge to me you know now that you mentioned like we were just watching that a few days ago i think it's on hbo right yeah, yeah. yeah it's on hbo max so like yeah. we were, it was literally on but it brings me back to childhood like yeah. when we used to watch it right like it's probably not the best movie to watch as a kid but either way no, yeah it wasn't but see that's what's interesting is that like <laughs> even before that like i would say it's something like uncle jj like our relationship yeah. with him was very, you know, different. Like he was uncle, we were nephews and we, but for some reason there's something about Mary was one where when we finally all watched it and we started joking around with the same jokes. Yeah. There was like some sort of connection now. There was like a bond, Yep, you know, and that's something that, yeah, with movies, um, really they have the power to do, you know, like, like music actually music is very similar, Yeah, but movies take you on, I feel like a longer journey. Mm-hmm. Right. You can it's almost like you guys all went on the same adventure in the same shoes for know? like two hours. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's and that's why storytelling and, um, you know, just connection was just very important to me. Yeah. I feel like we um, Uncle JJ brought us to the theater mm-hmm. a lot. Like Uncle Jay, uh, Nino Rio, like you boy, you boy. Yeah, yeah. Um. We I mean, I go back to like when we were young and like summertime at Mama's house um, and we would that's when we watch a lot of TV shows and film like the films we watch in the movie theater. It was like more like the fun ones, like I guess, but definitely like now that you bring it up, Titanic was that movie where I remember going to the theater a lot. Yeah. It was like that or like Ninja Turtles or something. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I remember uncle JJ brought us to fight club in the theater. Fight club. And like the he, yeah, he introduced to that. The matrix was a huge yeah. one. Um, I mean, I can, man, thinking about it, Uncle Jay influenced us a lot about film and music. Yeah, so. he did. I remember the first time I ever saw the cover of Pulp Fiction was in his room. And yeah. it was like Uma Thurman on the couch. And it was just something so... I was like a young kid and I I had no idea what the movie was about, but I knew it was bad. <laughs> you know, and Everything Uncle in Uncle Jay's Jay room was bad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it was kind of like a, a little window into like adulthood at the same time. Yeah. But and Uncle JJ used to drive us everywhere. So he, we would listen to his music, you know, Offspring... You know, punk rock, Blink-182. Yeah. And all the way to like Wu-Tang, mm-hmm. Limp Bizkit, yeah. Korn. Yeah. Oh, so my gosh. He man. definitely influenced us a lot in that. Um, And I, I don't know if you remember, but also we watched Star Wars like yeah. a lot. Oh, um, yeah. Phantom Menace. Oh, yeah. When it came out. And we watched the, all the old Star Wars movies in the theater. You know, like mm-hmm. with Ontario when everyone got really into it. And, and to be honest, Uncle JJ was the one that got me into Star Wars like... He, when Phantom Menace was about to come out, he sat That's us right. down and he got his, his like cassette tapes. Yeah. Right. And we played the um, two sets. New Hope all yeah. the way to Return of the Jedi. And yeah, that's the first time I remember seeing Star Wars. And I would, that right. was it. it. Like my life changed. <laughs> like it was True. all about Star Wars. And he was also the first guy that I think um, got us into like collecting things. 
or explaining yeah. that when you buy something right now and you don't open it, <laughs> don't open it, yeah. it's going to have value in the future. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know. Does he saw like it's a Darth Maul yeah, action the, figure, right? The deluxe Darth. Yeah, the deluxe, deluxe action Darth Maul figure. action figure from Episode One. That would I be, think he still has it. That would be really valuable right now. Yeah, I mean, that's funny. I mean, maybe uh, maybe Logan has it right now, but <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. But um, yeah, that's that's all right. So just when you when when someone asks me why I want to be a filmmaker, yeah, a lot of that comes from that, like psychologically and culturally. That's why I want to be a filmmaker. And and on top of that, growing up, I always loved to draw, and and we were in a band together, so I always loved music. True. And it's funny when I was twelve, when we were, I was twelve, you were ten. You know, my early teenage years, I thought I was going to be a rock star. I, you know, I wanted yeah. to. I saw that tour life. You know, like guitars and just living in a van. I think at some point we all thought our <laughs> band was going to make it. Oh well, yeah, but. Deep down, deep down, we thought, but um, yeah, no, that was like that was my goal at that age, and um, and I always tell everyone this that when growing up, um, when college was about to come around, filmmaking, music, it all kind of just went away because you know our culture, we have to choose a job that I guess is respectable in our parents' eyes. Yeah, you know, and yeah, so I had to do something in the medical field. Right. Yep. That's and the that's, uh, that's the recommendation. Yeah, recommendation, or like at least the the hope and the you know ex- like not expectation. Yes, but the hope you know that you could do something like that. So I, I actually went into psychology. Like I wanted to be a psychologist. That's right. But that it's just too long. So yeah. So I ended up kind of like going into medical coding, which is another story. But but psychology was always something that I was interested in as well. And filmmaking is the only medium for me that can encapsulate everything that I've been into, like sketch, sketching, music, acting, and psychology. I was able to do all of that in making one film, you know, and telling stories. So, yeah, like that was, it was almost like I didn't get to, I didn't choose it. It was there. It was there for me to, to fall into. Yeah, like, so the projects that we're working on now, like, it's, it's really interesting to me because your of your background in coding like i i think there's always a uh, there's always a relation to like what we've done and the experience you've gotten and how it applies to yeah. your projects now mm-hmm. so like coding i mean um all i really know about it is like after a procedure or someone's visit to the hospital or something you, the doctor kind of wants a bill he wants a bill of everything that he did yeah and it's almost like a car, me- car mechanic or something <laughs> Kind of, yeah. Okay. Like a receipt. And then, you know, yeah, it's like a receipt of like a, an appraisal of everything they did. And then yeah. there's a biller that asks, that sends out to the patient yeah. to pay, right? Um, I don't know. I'm curious. Like, was there anything from coding that you feel like it probably wasn't the path at the time? Or did you, what did you, what did you get from it to get you to what you're doing now? How does it help? You know, and that's the thing is that coding was never really anything on the horizon for me. I never saw it. Until um, Arnold Delvano, remember Arnold? Yeah. He was a coder and he was making good money. Mm-hmm. Well, at the time, you know, he was like, his first job was like $25 an hour, which was like, whoa, amazing. To yeah, me. at the time. At yeah. At the time. And I was like, I was making 10 bucks an hour at Best Buy. Oh, so sorry. that sounded amazing to me. He's like six, like two to three months of studying and pass the test and your first job, you'll have $25 an hour. And I was like, that sounds pretty good. That sounds, yeah. <laughs> that's to funny. someone out of college or out of high school, like, that yeah. sounds amazing. Yeah, and it's just three months. And it's like $2,000 just to join the course. This course was technically not, like, a big course, but it gets you to pass the test. It was like a, a, it was like a private... Private practice kind of thing. Private practice private school. school. And, um, yeah, no, it, it was not anything I thought about doing, but I joined it purely for the money and the fact that it had medical <laughs> in, the, yeah. in the name. So that's why it's just like, oh, shoot. So it's medical, quick, easy. I can, yeah. I can get my foot on top of it and it can lift me up to what I really want to do, you know. But I think because, I mean, we, you know, like you said, like our parents and our culture community like really upholds the medical field. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously we're Filipinos, so it's yeah. always upheld. And obviously the sincerity in that and like, you know, the goodwill of it is good. But really because they know and everyone says it that there's always going to be people to take care of so that's yeah. a that's a stable position to have anything in medical is stable and it still is yeah but it, coming from the medical field too like there's a reason why i'm doing things the way i'm doing right now cuz i felt like it it wasn't really there for me either 
Mm-hmm. Now, I did get something out of it, and it changed who I am and how I view life and how I view like putting in work and you know doing what I should do yeah. for others, right? And I got that from you know from nursing, and, and um, I'm still teaching part time, but it kind of got me to the understanding of if it's not what I truly should end up with, it's not really what I wanted to end up with. Mm. I got what I need, and I'm moving forward. Yeah, um, I'm not abandoning that completely. I'm still going to get my renewal, like license renewed, renewed, and everything. But um, it really did shape. Who I am. Like, how do you, like, because of coding, Mm -hmm. when you're directing or you're writing now, like, was there something that connected the two? Or was it like a complete, like, I'll forget this, dude, I'm doing this now? (laughs) No, no, that's actually a really good question. I I don't think I would have done coding uh, for as long as I did, which was seven years. Yeah. I don't think I would have done it as long as I did if I wasn't, number one, um, good at it. Mm -hmm. And number two, um, found some interest in it. Yeah. And it's funny that you, the way you described coding was more like billing, right? It was. Okay. It was like a receipt and like a like a car mechanic. Yeah, that's more billing. Okay, coding is like an auditor. Like we're like IRS. Like oh. where like are you truthful on this paperwork, or did you document everything? You know, you're more so auditing the doctor. The doctor. Okay. Yeah, like we want to make sure that number one, he's treating the patient correctly, nice. and number two, that he's not lying about treating the patient. Like he's not throwing in extra stuff that he didn't actually do, mm. right? Or or if he's like kind of like. Um, in a way like up upping his pay you know just because you know like like let's say you know diabetes the patient has diabetes but they're like you know like borderline and he just says they're diabetes just to get the money right Got it. but if the if their hba1c right mm-hmm. doesn't reflect diabetes yeah then he's he's upping his pay because he can't necessarily diagnose them as diabetic until oh, a certain level okay right so it's like 7.0 and above, you're yeah. diabetic. So if a guy's 6.4 and he says diabetes, it's yeah, we have to flag that. Yeah, it's not technically diabetes. Like no. They might be pre-diabetic, if anything, but you can't say yeah. full-blown Exactly. And that's why we, we would send it back and we say, hey, doctor, um, nice. HB1C is 6.4. Um, we, can't, we can't tell him what to diagnose, but we can say, does that indicate pre-diabetes or diabetes? You know, like giving uh. him a chance. You know. So so doctors do get checked with that then. I think they should. <laughs> a lot of people don't realize that. I yeah. think um people have this perception that like yeah, doctors are like mechanics. Yeah. So it's almost like there's an auditor for a mechanic like making sure they did or they're including the right information, yeah. not trying to get more money out of, you know, that would or be really scheming, cool scamming if people. Car mechanics had that too. <laughs> but yeah, it's not cars aren't as important <laughs> as people. A car mechanic uh coder? Team? Coder. Yeah, medical like mechanic coder. But, Interesting, um, and not all mechanics are like that. Obviously, it's just no, not yeah, all doctors course, are like that either. But not. Um, I, I think see that's what's funny is that um, you know, that's where it kind of led into a little bit of the interest in me is that uh-huh. with medical coding, it was like a I was like a detective. You know, it's forensics, and mm-hmm. I'm looking at the forensics of the paperwork and the documentation of of um, uh, an occurrence or like an incident that happened, and I wasn't in the room. I'm just going by his documentation. Right. Oh so man. I so your there. attention to detail is it has yeah. to be insane. Yeah, and that's where I had to train myself to really look at the clues. And you find patterns, but you really have to look at the clues and little things that don't add up. And it's like that's what coding was really. I'm curious about. then, based on the information that you were given, could you kind of picture the the client? Can you picture the patient you based see, on what they have? That would be awesome, but I I don't have the medical background to <laughs> okay. do that. I see it as numbers and I see it as words. You know, and interesting. I, and some words should go together. That's that's kind of what I see it. So it's like, uh, see, I haven't done coding in a while, but it's like, <laughs> right, if this person has diabetes, I need to see the word insulin somewhere. Yeah. In the yep. paperwork, you know, and it's like, if there's no insulin, I have to question the doctor. Are you treating the diabetes? Right. Yeah. So and, is it an active problem? It's yeah. You know, it's if they're not giving them any medication for it, then yeah. how is it a problem? Or it's like, um, I think hypertension. I see hypertension a lot. Yep. And it's like, um, I think out of out of uh, low low. Uh, are atorvast- oh, I forgot. Atorvastatin? Atorvastatin? Like, yeah, yeah Lipitor. See, <laughs> I've never seen it. See, and that's like a cholesterol drug. So okay. that does lower uh, yeah, the, blood actually, pressure. Like high cholesterol, that, that's yeah. part. You always see hypertension, high cholesterol, you know, and stuff like that. And once you see hypertension, high cholesterol, you should see diabetes somewhere. Yeah, they're bit. linked. Yeah, Definitely. And obesity, it, probably. Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. And morbid obesity. And yeah. when they're morbidly obese, you need to see their BMI. So it, it kind of like sets you down a path. Yeah. Like, 
and I do feel like a forensics detective when I do that. Wow. And when I really, you know, really try, <laughs> you know, that's the problem is that a lot of the charts look start to like blend together. But yeah, that was definitely something that um, interested me. And it was really cool to kind of stretch those muscles of detail and just looking for patterns in things. Yeah. But also, it also kind of scratched that itch of me where <laughs> I've learned as I'm writing um, different stories that when i don't i don't set out to to create a theme i just kind of write what i feel and i and a lot of the themes that come out is um it's kind of like deceit and deception oh. is very yeah it's it's a prevalent part yeah. of a lot of my writing because i think truth is very important to me and i feel like there's nothing more truthful than a person lying to either themselves or to to other people <laughs> you know <laughs> and that to me, like with coding, it's like I always come to it like the doctor is lying, so I have to find his lie, you know. And, yeah, and, that's or, weird. Or he's lying to himself, you know. He's he's not doing it correctly. So yeah, you're basically questioning everything that comes in front of you. Kind of, yeah. Like I have, which to. is a good skill to have, I think. Yeah. With anything in life. Yeah, exactly. It kind of trained me to do that, and that, I, that's why I, I never say that the coding didn't help me in any way. Yeah. Like you said, like with your nursing, it it really shaped you to who you are. Yeah. Coding definitely stretched those muscles for me to be detail oriented and to, you know, to question everything and to throw things at, you know, at things and see what happens, you know, like yeah. really um, inspect it and not take it for what it is right away. You know, yeah. that was important. So when you're writing um, and you're so, I mean, I would say like right now, like you're in like a lot of writing stages, like you've been writing more, I want to say in the past month or two. Yeah. Actually, or, I mean, I mean, you've been writing for a long time. I remember yeah. your notebooks back then. Um, or even like the the movies, video games, and like the yeah. PC game. <laughs> um, I will say that um, a lot of it is pretty dark, or yeah. I would not dark, but um, it has a lot of like Tarantino vibe. A lot of uh, like, well, the last one that you read was like the Steve. It was like Stephen King to me. <laughs> um, does that yeah. stem from somewhere? I don't know. Like, or is it? You said you just write what you feel, right? But yeah. I mean. Yeah. Where does that come from? Oh, yeah, that's that's funny that you mentioned it because I did, um, I did start thinking about that. Like, because once I started finishing scripts, a lot of my scripts end almost the same way, and they have a lot of running themes of like guns and yeah. murder and suicide. Yeah, <laughs> and I think <laughs> I number uh, I think that comes from a couple of places. And number one is that I'm not that great of a writer, so when I need to interject conflict or stakes, life and death is the first thing I think about. Mm. Um, conflict is a gun in someone else's face. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's a very low hanging fruit. Right. And, um, that, that's why I think I, I write guns a lot <laughs> because I, I just can't, I'm not, you know, um, <laughs> I, I'm just not smart enough to write anything better, you know, to create a more depth in their, in the conflict. It's just easy. But, um, oh, I see. yeah. And, but also I think it does come from a place of crime and truth and deception and yeah yeah and interesting it's yeah it's always been um very interested to me that um when people lie you know like that's the one thing i like, think yeah well, like why do they lie or why? what do you think what, what do people lie about yeah. it's super interesting what do they lie about and why, why are they, they lying, lying? Yeah. and why are they lying to this specific person yeah you know? and a lot of what interests me about that is that deception comes a lot from internal like you're you're lying to yourself first before you lie to someone else. I, yeah. I think, you know, I, I'm not any professional in it, but when I write something, that's usually mm. what ends up coming out. It's like, if you're lying, you're actually more unhappy with yourself than you are with the situation. You know, there's, there's something internal about that. And the fact that you could do that with a story is amazing or a, a movie, right? Like visually, um, I think not that it's because it's dark, but um, the, the, the deception like towards yourself brings out this um in a lot of your stories it brings out this um conversation that someone can have with themselves like is there something that i'm hiding from myself or is there something that i'm not willing to accept in my life and i i, I think yeah. a lot of your stories causes that kind of disruption in the normal everyday pattern mm -hmm. which, which are the movies that we love watching yeah like exactly. it makes you think after and it makes you reflect exactly reflection that's yeah. that's the the biggest part for me is that you look inside of yourself and you, I mean, from a basic level from cinema, it's like 
can you put yourself in the character shoes and what would you do yeah. in that situation? And that's the most basic thing. Wow. And that's what I like about movies is that in storytelling is that you can walk in someone's shoes and not actually have to live the the choice, but no, learn something about yourself where it's like, oh, well, I wouldn't have done that. Or, wow, I would have totally done that. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I would have totally killed that guy. Like, that's wow. crazy. Which is what, which is kind of that conversation we had on the, on the golf course where it's like, what, what is empathy? Oh, right. Yeah. Like, and yeah. having empathy for people, I think is, is what's missing in the world <laughs> right now. Yeah, It's lacking for sure. Um, yeah. So how do you, I mean, for the way I explain empathy is like, you know, if you put yourself in their shoes, um, rather than feeling bad for them, you put yourself in their shoes and try to understand how they're feeling and how, why they're doing what they're doing. Mm-hmm. So it's not saying like that it's okay that someone, you know, shot somebody or killed somebody. No. But the conversation I have with myself is I want to I want to see and understand how someone can get to that point. Yeah. So when you're writing a story and empathy um I think the the scary thing about that is if you do have empathy then you're kind of free to write the craziest situations or or things, right? 100% I think Was there ever a time that you were writing And you're kind of like Dude this is too bad <laughs> It's like too scary Or too violent I don't know You know not necessarily Because um, I, I don't think I think I've never felt that way Because my stories Always come from a place of empathy Where I want to learn more About this character And about myself Right I'm, yeah. I'm wrestling with something With some questions that I don't know what to answer But I think I would get to that point If I was more um, What's the word Um just uh exploitation where i'm just yeah. doing it just for the fuck of it yeah know, just for the hell of it and i just yeah i never I, that doesn't interest me that much <laughs> i mean it's fun yeah yeah but the stories that i really like you know t- teach me something about the world or about myself you know so i i don't think i think coming from that starting point is always going to have some truth in it you know, and that's why I really want that. Is that I think if once you get to a, an exaggerated level where it's not truthful anymore, yeah, that's not fun for me. But that's the point where it's like, all right, this is too much. This is deplorable. Yeah, and it's and it's porn, right? Yeah, it's uh, violent porn, violence porn. You know, anything. It's gratuitous. Yeah. So I think the there's a balance that you understand that you don't have to go that far to get no. that meaning out, to get the story out, and and that balance. I think the word really is truth. Right. Yeah. We know what's true. We know what's real. And if once I pass that line of truth and it becomes a little too exaggerated, you can flirt with the above level of truth a little bit. And but everyone knows it's like, all right, that's a little bit ridiculous. And Mm -hmm. and I'm not talking in a way of like horror films where like a ghost or like a demon, like some people don't believe in that. But yeah, that could be truthful, too. But the point is, is that the character has to be truthful. The character has to make choices that, yeah, like you said, under that you understand. Yeah, like Breaking Bad. I mean, I've never met a guy that that was like a father that started making meth and became the kingpin of you know pretty much southern United States. Yeah, of crystal meth, and it's ridiculous, right? It's yeah, it's, it'll never. I mean, it's probably happened, but it doesn't happen in my backyard. But the point is that Vince Gilligan said he's like, you don't have to agree with everything that Walt does, but you have to understand why 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 he does and how he got to that point yeah and that's that's drama that's that's what storytelling is about you know yeah. being able to understand yeah i and i think that helps us as far as like our personal relationships and i think you know in the past few years a lot has happened with like our family in particular mm-hmm. and you know i i think we've we've tried our best to we've done our best to write the real narrative and be honest with what happened and what um what truth came out of it and I think it took a long time for us to to process through and mm-hmm. basically come out of it with more empathy for people. And I, I think this, these past few years, our family, um, our particular family, has created a lot of empathy and understanding for others. Mm-hmm. Understanding that people will do what they do because of a number of factors, right? Yeah. How they were brought up, how they view the world, and honestly, what they want for themselves. Mm-hmm. And I mean, in the end, it's everyone's out for themselves unfortunately right and i mean let's be honest like we all see people and people do good work and everything but even in good work people feed their egos right it's like oh like when someone you know if if someone's a nurse it's like oh yeah i saved the world i'm a frontliner i mean (laughs) so are we doing it for that or are we doing it for you know 
the just the good nature of humans, right? So um, I, I think our family alone has just our 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 eyes have been opened mm-hmm. to the reality of you know like not everything in life is rainbows and butterflies. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, that so like going through that, I think it did help us. It changed. I think it changed everybody in in our family um, to kind of look at life a certain way. Like I feel like we grew up with this lens that we were given, looking through this lens like one way, one truth. That's why truth and deception is is a running thing to me. Is that yeah. you can grow up thinking one thing, and and one day you wake up and you learn the truth, and it's just like, whoa! Well, yeah. I've been I've been making choices in my life. Yeah. If I had just known the truth, maybe my life would be different. Maybe I would be a better person. I don't know. Yeah. And that's the scary part. Again, empathy where I got to that point where like, I understand like maybe that's as far as they're capable of being. That's it. Yeah. And I can't get mad at that. I can't get mad at the person because they're all going through their own story. Mm -hmm. Right. But I I definitely think now we've changed for the better. And um, I mean, like the stories we write, the projects that we're working on reflect now a lot of depth, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I'm starting to see how my storytelling is being affected by the situation because what I didn't understand about writing before to create a real character that that has a story worth telling, number one, is the character has to start off in their world where it's like homeostasis, right? Yeah. Where everything's good in their eyes. They're living their life mm-hmm. and they want something. So they set out on an adventure to get that thing. When they get it, they realize... They didn't need that thing at all. They yeah. wanted something deeper. So there's a lot of depth in storytelling and, and from that aspect. So that's when I, you go back deeper. And I'm learning this. I learned this just from experience now. Before you lie to someone else, you lie to yourself first. You know, And if you lie to yourself that you're, I'm a good person and everything I do is good, in a way that's kind of dangerous because then you justify everything you do. So now that you're lying to yourself, you justify lying to someone else saying something else and doing something else and you and you automatically put yourself on the side of I'm good and if I disagree with this person he's bad you know yeah and that's there's a deeper under like level of understanding yourself there you know if you think that you can never be wrong then every time someone disagrees with you they're always ro- like everyone wrong. else is wrong they're always every wrong. time yeah yeah so there's a deeper level of of misunderstanding yourself and like you said this is probably where this person as far as he like he or she can go yeah right that because that's how far he or she knows themselves right that's it it's yeah it's and their self-awareness is to that point and that's it they can't go past it yeah and or either they they can't go past it or they don't want to because they got to a point in their life where like wow i'm a good person (laughs) yeah (laughs) they're comfortable don't change myself ever again yeah and and the things that they surround themselves with it's justified yeah i'm a good person everyone loves me just keep getting that validation and yeah and the dangerous thing is that once you get to that point you know you're on that pedestal you think you're on top of the world and there's nowhere to go up then you stop learning you stop teaching yourself you stop growing stop growing yeah yeah once you realize once you think you don't you don't have to change you don't have to grow you don't have to learn i've learned everything that's very dangerous because yeah you become very solid yeah, and there's no more sense of urgency or just no more sense of like vitality and vibrancy vitality. to look at life. Yeah, yeah. So like on the surface, they like it looks like a good life and they're happy. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, are they searching for life still? Like why, why are we living then, mm-hmm. right? Like if we're living in that comfort zone. And I can definitely see it, you know, and it's, it's unfortunate. I, I feel bad for them. I think that's where we get to. That's the empathy. Yeah, yeah. like I actually feel bad for them. And us being truthful and resolute in our path, mm-hmm. like for us, that's what proves to me that, you know, God is real. Like I've never doubted my faith in God No, yeah, because of that. And I mean, I'm not going to lie. It, it challenged it at some point, but I feel like it strengthened um, my relationship with God. Mm-hmm. For me, it, it brought me closer. I don't know. Like as far as like a faith path because of that, how did it affect like spirituality and, and faith? That, you know, and that's a really interesting uh, point is that I do, I, when I first, when this first happened, I do feel like my, my uh, faith was shook. So I did start looking at faith and religion from a lo- like a logical standpoint more often than I used to. But, you know, I think luckily enough, or just because of the, 
the grace of God and my the strength of the faith that he instilled in me, I think the way I saw it was not that I was closer to God or farther. I think I saw an aspect of faith and God in a different way that I never saw. You know, I, I saw a different angle yeah. to appreciate it more and to and to use it in a different way. Because I think it was it, it became three dimensional almost for me. Rather than, you know, I was just looking at it from one aspect, one perspective, and that was it. You know, there's no, there's, you don't throw rocks at it. Once I started throwing rocks at it, I started seeing things that it could do that I never thought it could do, that I could do with my faith, right? So that I definitely, not, not only do I feel closer to God, but I feel like I understand faith and I understand myself more um, as far as like why I believe in it. So yeah. I, I think that's a big conversation for people to hear now because there's just like, I, I don't know, I feel like there's going to be this religious awakening for a lot of people in the world because of what's happening. Oh, and I feel like that's been, point. we've been kind of taken away. Um, society, right? Community and society, the world has been kind of taken away from that spiritual aspect of like finding faith in a higher power. Mm-hmm. I feel like people are searching for that even more now. Yeah. And I was always, we were always that type to like understand why. But, but then, or at least try to find out why. Like, why do we say this? Why do we do that? Yeah. Understanding that would be a, an actual practice. It would be an actual ritual or, or um, a, a meditation, a meditative moment. Mm-hmm. Like a prayer is not just words. It's a prayer is, is deep. It's, it's energy. It's moving things. Yeah. Right? And um, I'm hoping that there's this big religious awakening, not in a sense of like one specific religion, but that people will tap into that. I think that's where I got to, where I, I don't put faith in people anymore. Mm-hmm. I put faith in, in the higher power that drives all of us to do and bring goodness yeah. in the world. In a, way, in a way, we're lucky that we were able to see that side where it's like, don't grow up having your faith and your spirituality tied to a specific person. Just keep it tied between you and God. You know, That's the most yeah. important thing. And I think a lot of problems with religion is that people naturalistically want to feel like they're responsible for someone else's spirituality and that they're responsible for them feeling good, but not responsible for them feeling bad. You know, they don't, there's no accountability, right? Yeah. If anything bad happens now, if I do anything, you know, wrong, it doesn't reflect anyone else. Like it's on me. And if I want to feel good, it's on me. No one's going to make me feel good. And that's the, that's the most important part. You know, you don't, you don't go there to make other people make you feel good. You learn, you have to learn to swim by yourself in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Now we're implementing something we always talked about when we were young and serving in the youth, in the youth ministry Mm -hmm. of, you know, the the battles out there, it's not here in the church. It's not in our activities. The battle was always out there. We always labeled it and talked about it like that. Um, And we can't be afraid to go out and, and fight the actual battle. Like it's easy to be around people that are chanting the same thing, yeah, or singing the same song, but when you're out here singing on singing on your own and you're by yourself, are you able to stand tall with your faith and understand that you know God is out here? Are you able to keep your your uh, your tune? Like, are yeah. you able to carry the melody exactly. by yourself? Yeah, and I think people are afraid to like forget the melody, to forget the harmony, because they're by themselves. And yeah. I mean, until that point, you won't know. If you've truly ingrained everything, yeah. embodied everything that you learned from a church or yeah. a place of worship. That's actually really cool. Like, that's interesting. I never saw it like that where it's like you're in church, everyone's singing together. So yeah. you can just follow everyone else. Yeah. There's a piano playing, you know. But <laughs> what, the what key we're in. Exactly. Yeah. The, in the world, you're by yourself. Acapella, you know. Acapella, dude. And that's where you really know, do you know this song? <laughs> yeah. You know, did you really study this song? Did you ingrain this song in yourself? That's, yeah, that's how, that's the only way you'll know because you, it, oh. before that you're just listening to everyone and you'll never really hear your own voice. Not necessarily, unless you obviously do the ear thing, but yeah, yeah, you just, you have to know that you know this. We were ingrained to think one day we're going to have to teach this. Like one day people are going to yeah. have, like we're going to have something to say and people are going to listen to what we say. So it came from a place of, okay, I need to understand this because I don't want to look like an idiot, number one, and yeah. I don't want to teach the wrong thing, Yeah. right? So we we did luckily come into that aspect of, yes, like understand this 100% inside and out, like the back of your hand, rather than other people would just be like, 
okay, this is the right way. I'll, I'll go that way. And I don't really yeah. need to know. And just follow blindly. Follow blindly. And that's that's fine. You know, and that's luckily we were ingrained from a young age. People, you know, they, they were telling us like one day you're going to have to tell these stories. You're going to have to yeah. teach people this, you know, and and our parents like mom and dad were very instrumental in making us understand why we're doing this, you know, and with dad, he he would make us put together like cabinets and stuff like that. <laughs> but yeah. he would always at the end, he would always say like, well, you need to learn how to do this because this because one day yeah. you're gonna need to do to to learn how to do this and i won't be here right yeah true so yeah it, it really set us off on a path for me for sure is that 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 that's part of the empathy and that's also part of the understanding you have to understand why you're doing something and why someone else is doing something you know so we were lucky in a way of like that when we are told to do something we we do it with a purpose we do it you know, with a deeper understanding of why it's necessary. Yeah, I totally see it now, like in our lives. Like, obviously, we live on our own now. And it's like the things that I thought about in the past, like chores that I hated doing, like sweeping the garage and stuff. It really does resonate now because if no one will do it, it if I don't do it, no one's going to do it. It won't get done. Exactly. And now we live in like a (laughs) shithole. As a child, you don't you don't see that far. You know, and yeah. you don't think about that. But as a parent, you do. Yeah. So it really comes down to patience uh, for the parent to explain it. Yeah. But yeah, it's that communication of teaching. You teach your child to to appreciate cleaning because you don't want to live. And mom, the way mom would say it is like, you don't. if you don't clean, there's going to be rats in yeah. your clothes. You yeah. Know, you're going to stink. <laughs> you know, and that's her way of explaining it. But she did explain it. Yeah. It wasn't like, I'm your sure. mother. Yeah. Do it because I said so. There's no point. Yeah. There's no reason. If you ask me what a real leader is supposed to do, it's to lead by example and to be direct most of the time. Let's, yeah. let's not beat around the bush. That's one of the traits as a director that I, I honestly value is that, number one, you have to know that you're coming from the right place and that you believe in what you're doing. Yeah. And so that's the only way I can, I can pull myself out of bed and tell people what to do, right? Like if I'm a director and I need an actor to give me a certain emotion, mm-hmm. I will do anything I can to get that, you know, within reason, only because I believe what we're doing is important and and it's the truth. Yeah. So and you're gonna get that result. You're gonna get it and it's worth it. By yeah, yeah. and honestly yeah. it might not be welcomed, but like it's by any means necessary. They'll benefit from it at the end, right? Yeah. They'll benefit from it and you're creating something, you know? Yeah. And I think that's something with dad. He he believed in what he was created creating mm-hmm. and he believed it was important to help out these kids. So it was more important than, you know, what people thought about him at some point, but um, yeah, it's it's it, a lot of being a director is sticking to your guns and believing what you want is the right way. Other people will have their other opinions of how it should be done, but yeah. as a director, I have to trust myself that I'm doing this out of ego, like no ego, yeah, whatsoever, and I'm doing it for the truth, for the story, you know, for you know, for the people that watch this, you know, and that's. The only way as a director you can survive is if you believe in it hard enough because people will believe in other things. It's, it's a battle mm-hmm. of wills at that point. And it's funny that that's kind of um, the muscle and that's the, the muscle I flex a lot as a director and people, and it's, it's scary to one of the fears is that um, are people just following me because of who I am and they're afraid to say something Oh, yeah. You know? So that's always that fear of like, um, I want this to be good, but people don't believe if I'm just doing this out of ego or if I, they don't know if I'm doing it to show off or if I'm doing this because I feel like I'm power hungry. And and all that is projection by other people. Exactly. Yeah. Like maybe because I don't want to say like people are thinking that, but I'm sure there's somebody that's thinking I want to be a, the leader here someday mm-hmm. or I want to find my position and like this guy He's getting that kind of praise and it's like, oh, it's because he wants to be the leader. Well, dude, you're projecting yeah. then your you own know? insecurities. Yeah. I feel like, like I said, one of my running things is deception and lies. <laughs> and I don't think people lie from an evil place, right? Of course. I think it's more of like, more so people lie to not hurt the other person. And yeah. I think I like to surround myself with people that are good people. So having that difficult conversation, like what we talk about, right? And- being able to be blunt and honest sometimes will hurt people. Yeah. So when you surround yourself with very good hearted people, they tend to 
beat around the bush. They tend to walk on eggshells for you, you know, so that you don't feel, um, you know, hurt and you don't feel like disrespected, which is a good thing. That is a good thing. Yeah. But one of my favorite lines from the West Wing is um, the president loves smart people who disagree with him. And and I, mm. that always made sense to me that I don't mind being disagreed with. Right. Yeah. I don't because I know I will be wrong at some point. You know, I, I, I do. I believe that I do everything I do is important. And um, I only do it because I, I believe it's important. But I, I people make mistakes I'm, and I'm not immune to that. But I want people that know what we're trying to do and we have the same goal. They're smart enough to solve the same question. But there's but they disagree with me and they respect me enough to tell me to my face like like this isn't what we talked about. This isn't the goal we're going for. Yeah. You know, and that's that's something I respect. That's a, that's the mark of a good leader. Yeah. I think the, the mark of a good leader is knowing that problems will arise and we're going to get through and we're going to learn from it because mm-hmm. it's ultimately better for us. Yeah. I mean, so. it's it's you can find lots of metaphors for it. You know, it's just when you work out, you need to break down the muscle. It's going to yeah. be painful. It's going to hurt. You have, to, but you, the only way to grow is to is to keep breaking it down to a ground zero level, right? Yeah, and yeah, yeah and you can keep building on top of that, but yeah. you can't build on something that you believe is already at its full height. You know, true. And people will disagree with that, and yeah, and that's why when I say directing, it's like people will have their own opinion about how it should be done, but as a director, I have to do what I want to do, and yeah. that's that's where the fear comes in of. Uh, I don't want to come off as a dictator and I don't want to come off as like I'm cracking the whip, but I just believe in it enough that I know it's going to be good. And I know no matter what I do, I want it to be good. But also if it's going to be my name on it and it sucks, that's fine. I want it to suck because I tried to make it good and I suck. I'd rather that be it <laughs> rather than yeah. I followed other people's, oh, I've, I followed other people's advice and I did things that I wouldn't normally do. Mm-hmm. but my name is on it. I'm labeled like this is this is what I wanted. And it's like I have to believe that this is what I wanted before I release it out there because I would die. I'd rather die on my own sword. On my own sword yeah, and, like and die with the acceptance of this is the sword I chose and yeah. this is the path I chose. And I, I'm, I'm confident enough and egoless enough to know that if they don't like what I like, that's fine. I yeah. liked it. <laughs> I liked it enough to put it out there and that's important. Yeah. I, that's number one. I have to like it. Oh man, yeah, yeah. I, you're gonna be a regular here on the podcast. So um, <laughs> thank you, no, no, thank you, man. It. And I, I look forward, that. honestly, all the projects that we're working on. I'm looking forward to all of that. It's gonna be um, the next few years are just gonna be amazing. I think we're gonna no, keep moving yeah. forward. So. And I thank you so much for you know just helping me with, helping me with all those projects and supporting me. And it's that's very important to me, you know. And yeah. just someone I respect. Oh, thank and, you, know, you your bro. opinions and everything like that and i learned so much from you every time we talk and thank it's you it's great that's why I, I i do hope we do more of this because i learn a lot that's the thing we're like <laughs> this is the beginning is like, i feel like it's act two in our lives yeah like, we've never a done new chapter this. so we've never done this and i've learned so much about myself already just being here yeah. that's that's awesome all right cool. <laughs> thank you man thank you all right